Put your hands together for Reverend Jasper Williams. Thirty-four years ago, um, almost to the day, August of 1984, a little more upstairs, if you will, 1984, thank you, I was privileged to deliver the eulogy for Dr. C.L. Franklin, and I opened that eulogy by asking everybody who was there to join me in his prayer hymn. And that was the way we opened it up. I'm gonna ask the songbird of the South, Sister Dottie Peoples, to accompany me. Father, I, I stretch my No, no, there, no other hell I, I know if thou we all have mentioned on today, and this is my subject, as I attempt to eulogize Aretha Franklin. My subject is Aretha, the Queen of Soul. Aretha, the Queen of Soul. Repeat after me, if you will. Aretha, the Queen of Soul. Sometimes during the month of May in 1964 at the Regal Theater in Chicago, Illinois, a local disc jockey by the name of Span Cooper officially anointed and crowned Aretha the Queen of Soul. 
But I have come here today to tell you, the people of the earth, that God crowned Aretha queen of soul long, long, long time ago. You may ask when, I'll tell you when, back before the morning star, back before the sons of God cried out for joy, before there was a when or a where, a why or a which, a this or a that, God crowned Aretha queen of soul. We see that here in the second chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In this one verse, do we see the total being and makeup of mankind? This verse alludes to the trichotomy of man, that man is made up out of three entities. And it lists these entities, body, spirit, and soul. It says, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. That's man's body. In the Greek, it is suma. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. That's pneuma, translated spirit. And then it says, and man became a living soul. That's suchi, or the inner man, his emotions, his will. Man became a living soul. So, and so this word form, God formed man. It's like that of a potter that takes his clay and shapes it so as to form the vessel that he is trying to make. And this is saying in essence that God was totally involved in the fashioning of mankind, that God took that dust of the earth, took it, and formed it and shaped it, configured it until he got it like he wanted it to be. And then God stood it up because it did not become he until he breathed into its nostrils the breath of life and then he became a living soul. So then this is saying in essence, as it relates to all of us, I am a spirit, I have a soul, I live in my body. I wish you would just repeat that after me if you don't mind. I am a spirit, I have a soul, I live in my body. But when we hear the title Queen of Soul, how does that connect with God? queen of soul. Well, this title comes from our black culture. You know, when we talk about queen of soul, it alludes to a form of music that is known to us as soul music. So what is that? What is soul music? Soul music is a type of music that is a combination of some of all of the music. Jazz, splattered with a little gospel, peppered with a little soul. It has all kinds of rock and then meshed into an urban rhythm kind of blues is soul music. So with all of the various musics wrapped up into soul music, that's evidence of the fact that there must be a God somewhere. But what does this word soul mean? What is soul? I think it is appropriate right along through here if I would allow Aretha's father, the late Dr. C.L. Franklin, to come and stand before us and tell us, Dr. Franklin, what soul is. Because back in 1955, Dr. C.L. Franklin created an album that was called The 23rd Psalms. And when he got to verse 3, where it says, He restoreth my soul, he said something I would like to quote. 
He says, and I quote, soul is pretty hard to define. Nobody can really say what soul is. He said, as close as we can come to defining soul is to say that soul is that part of man that is a little bit like God. That means then that God in man is soul. Again, God in man is soul. Thank you, Lord. And so when we come down to this thing called soul, today in our world, we look at our world as it is flowing and going and moving. And it is quite obvious that with the world moving as it is, that mankind is moving toward losing his soul. One day, back in the days of slavery, there was this slave owner who was getting ready to travel abroad, and he called his top-notch slave and said to him, John, I'm getting ready to go overseas, and I'll be gone for some several months, and I want you to take care of my child. I want you to take care of my child's clothes, take care of my child's shoes, take care of my child until I return. And then some several months went by, and John saw the boss coming down the road and ran to him and got down on his knees and said, Master, sir, here are your child's clothes. I washed them, I rinsed them, I ironed and I folded them neatly. Master, sir, here are your child's shoes. I shined them and I buffeted them. But master, sir, I lost the child. I lost the child. One of these old days, that awful day, will surely come upon it. I will make haste when I must stand before my judge and give and face that solemn test. That would be a critical time for some of us because we will say on that day, Master, sir, that body you gave me, I cherished it. I bathed it. I showered it. I washed it. I brushed the teeth daily. Master, sir, I put colognes under the neck and perfumes on my body. I anointed it with precious creams and ointments. Master, sir, I wined and dined the body you gave me. I laid and played in the body you gave me. I huffed and I puffed with the body you gave me. I joked and I jest with the body you gave me. But master, sir, I lost my soul. How cold, how chilling. How none redeeming. Listen, 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 listen. Master, sir, I lost my soul. Mm, I lost my soul. But what about your soul? What condition is your soul in today? That part of you that is supposed to be like God, where is it? What's going on? Have you lost your relationship with God? Have you? Let me tell you this. 100 years from this moment, it'll make no difference about how much money you got in your bank account. It'll make no difference about how many stocks and bonds and mutual funds you have invested in the Dow Jones Index. It won't make any never mind about how many men you have, women you have, what you've done, how she got mad with him because of what you said about her. 100 years from this moment, the only thing about any of us that will matter is whether or not your soul has been saved. That's all. 
That's all. That's all that will matter. But shift with me now, if you will, and come to where we are with the eyes of the world on us in this home-going celebration of Aretha, the queen of soul. The question that I want to ask, how can we take this iconic stature of Aretha Franklin, who we deem queen of soul? I mean, how can we walk out of this room today and say that it is Aretha's life, it is Aretha's legacy that has brought about real, true change in our world on today. I mean, how can we do that? How can we say that her life and what she has involved herself in while here on earth, that in this moment of the last day of the month of August 2018, when we carried her to her final resting place, true change came to our world. How can we immortalize the queen of soul? Well, right in here, we see the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. If we can see the black America, the African American community. If we can just remove the veneer, take away the prejudice, lay aside the biasness, and take a good, clean look at where we are in black America. If we are truthful, honest, and fair, we will have to say that Black America has lost its soul. The one thing that Black America needs today, more than anything else, is to come back home to God. Hush, listen, I hear the queen echoing in the wind. Something must be done, done, done. Something must be done, done, done. Something must be done, done, done. The queen is wanting to issue her mandate. She's wanting to sign her executive order. Something must be done, done, done. You may not know it, but Aretha did an awful lot for the civil rights movement. You've heard the various speakers talk about how she worked for Dr. King and took no monies for her services, how she mounted that podium and sang, Precious Lord, take my hand when we buried him back in 1968. And one of the other main things that I don't think too many of us may have recognized, but it was Aretha who spoke out and delivered Angela Davis from the awesome situation that she found herself in. And the thing that I remember about it is that my uncle, Reverend A.R. Williams, in Memphis, Tennessee, was close, confidant, bosom friend to Dr. Franklin. They, they played checkers every day. It was a time for them to kick back, unwind, relax, and talk smack one to another. And I remember Uncle Buddy, that's what we called him, talked about how it was that Reverend Franklin was disturbed about how Aretha went and got Angela Davis out of jail. And he hadn't heard that she was connected with communism. And he did not want that to be a blight on his church and a blight on his ministry. And he pumped Aretha. Why did you do that, Aretha? Why did you? And she, out of hysteria, said, Daddy, she is a black woman and had nobody to help her, and I wanted to help her. <laughs> Period. 
So I hear a voice again rumbling through the echo of the wind. Something must be done. Something must be done. Something must be done. No one can deny that black America, there is truly a need in our race. As I look back in retrospect, allow my mind to take a stroll back down memory's lane. There was a time when we as a race had a thriving economy. I remember we had our own little grocery stores. We had our own little hotels. They weren't big and fancy, but they were ours. I remember we even had our own little banks, ladies and gentlemen, as bad as the days of Jim Crow and segregation were. The one good thing out of segregation that it did for us it forced us to each other instead of for own each other. And we quickly come to realize that as a people, all we really have is one another. But when we marched, when we protested, when we got through singing, we shall overcome. Yes, we were rewarded with integration. We got what we fought for. We got what we marched for. But with the birth of integration, there also came the loss of not only the black community's economy, but there also came the loss of the black man's soul. Oh, you ain't got to say it, man. I know I'm preaching to you. We lost. We lost our soul. Oh, God, Jesus, help me today. We lost our soul. Why is your soul, black man? As I look in your house, there are no fathers in the home no more. Where is your soul? 70% of our households are led by our precious, proud, fine black women. But as proud, beautiful, and fine as our black women are, one thing a black woman cannot do, a black woman cannot raise a black boy to be a man. She can't do that. She can't do that. She can't do that. Black man, where is your soul? A study was released not long ago by Tuskegee Institute, and in this study, it showed how the Ku Klux Klan has killed 3,446 black people over an 86-year span of time. That's an awful lot of black people for anybody to kill. But the study also revealed that black people kill that number of black people not once a year and not 86 years, but every six months. So you multiply times two the 3,446, that means that we kill 6,000 plus black people every year. And over that 86 year span of time, that equates to us killing among us 592,712 black people are killed by black people. It amazes me how it is when the police kills one of us. We're ready to protest, march, destroy innocent property. We're ready to loot, steal, whatever we want. But when we kill 100 of us, 
Nobody says anything. Nobody does anything. Black on black crime. We're all doing time. We're locked up in our mind. There's got to be a better way. We must stop this today. Think down, look down, walk down, talk down, act down. And most times, we are low down. Where is your soul? And so, if you choose to ask me today, uh, do black lives matter? Let me answer like this. No, black lives do not matter. Black lives will not matter. Black lives ought not matter. Black lives should not matter. Black lives must not matter until black people stop respecting black lives and stop killing ourselves. Black lives can never matter. Walk around in our communities today it hurts my heart. Everybody you see in our community walking around like zombies. You know, just whacked on crap. Everybody high. Everybody drunk. They walk up to you and try to reach for you. You shoo them off like they're flies. Where is your soul? Where is your God? So shoot back and come to where we are. The queen's legacy, the queen's life. What can we leave here saying that the queen of soul has done, is doing, or will do that will impact us as a race? to turn our race around. The eyes of the world are upon us today because of late Dr. C.L. Franklin. I mean, despite the fact that his marriage faltered and he and his wife broke up, we don't know really what happened, but we do know that he ended up having to raise four children by himself. No, I'm not saying that Dr. Franklin exercised the best parenting skills that there are. I'm not saying that. By no impression am I trying to perpetrate that to you because he certainly did not. There was no way that a man called upon to preach the gospel as much as he did and have the awesome responsibility of pastoring his church. There's no way in the world that he could adequately raise through parenting skills. No way he could raise four children. Something in the home had to be wrong. There had to be some kind of deficit. And we can tell that it was a deficit somewhere because of the way the queen sang. Most of the songs we heard her sing, particularly in her early years, we could feel the pain, we could feel the hurt, we could feel her backsets and setbacks in life, we could feel her heartaches and heartbreaks in life because they met our heartaches. They met our backsets, our setbacks. We could feel that when she sang her song. Natural woman, ain't no way all of those songs that she sang. I'm not saying 
negatively about Dr. Franklin because I went down that same road. There's no need of me standing up here trying to make you think that my life has been squeaky clean because it hasn't. But take a lot of when it comes down to the home, oh God, Jesus. When it comes down to where and what the responsibility of us as a race is in our home with our children. When we fuss and when we argue and when we fight and separate and divorce, you're not cognizant of the fact that scars are put upon our children that sometimes they never see it until they get grown and get out on their own. And then they spot and see the scars that are upon their lives. But shift here with Dr. Franklin's situation as we look here at what he did with his children, and where we are with our children. He still exercised as best he could parenting skills. Anytime we stray away from God's design for what the home is supposed to be, havoc will be our results. I mean, God has told us what to do with the home. He designed the home. I mean, God put in the home a man and a woman, a father and a mother. See, God put in the home a husband and a wife, a provider and a nurturer. The provider is to provide for the home man's responsibility. The woman is to give nurturing, which means her role is to give the child love affection that prepares him or her for love and affection when they get out of the home. See? And whenever a man is not there and the provisions are not made for the home, and whenever the mother is not there and the child doesn't learn how to nurture and be loved and thereby love, the womb is to the child before birth what the home is to be to the child after birth. And whenever you take a foreign object and you put it into the womb before that baby is born, that's abortion before birth. And when that home is not like it ought to be, the father's not doing his part, the mother not doing her part, and the child has deficits, that's abortion. After birth. And so as a race, black America does not need better houses. Oh, we don't need no better houses. I know the government, big business and big corporations can provide for us better houses. They can give them to us. Sometimes I, we require and want to be given too much too often, but a home is what I see black people need more than a house. We don't need better houses given to us. We need to make for ourselves better homes. Better homes. We need better homes. Huh, huh? What did you say? What did you say? What did you say? Did you say, what's the difference in a house and a home? Well, may I tell you, there's a vast difference in a house and a home. A house is structural, but a home is spiritual. A house is man's master design, but a home is God's divine design. A house is a place of work, but a home is a place of peace. Oh God, keep my mind today, Jesus. A house 
It gives credit, leverage, and tax benefits for the home, gives neighbors, family, and community. A house has a 10, 15, 30 year mortgage, but a home has lifetime memories. God is in a home. Hell is in a house. No wonder nobody ever sings house, sweet house. But we always sing home, sweet home. So Dr. Franklin did not allow himself to be cramped into his daughter's future based on what he saw, not based upon what he thought. When he saw what his daughter had in her, he put her on a foundation so that she could rock steady baby. That's what he did. Sometimes we mess up our children when we force them to do and be what we want them to be. God does not give our children to us. God gives our children through us. And it's to be our responsibility to bring them to where God has destined them to be. So Dr. Franklin did a super fantastic job in making sure that his daughter had the kind of life in terms of her career. You may not know about it, but I remember like it was yesterday, the flat, the criticism, how they talked about him just because he wanted his daughter to live her life and to be who she came to be. He ain't no preacher. How can he be a preacher and he preaching the gospel and she's singing the blues? Back in that day and time, oh, how they talked about him. Everybody had thumbs down on C.L. Franklin preaching the gospel and letting his daughter sing the blues. I saw it with my own eyes. I remember it was in 1960 in Memphis, Tennessee at Ellis Auditorium. The promoters had promoted this to be a night where Reverend Dr. C.L. Franklin will preach at 8 o'clock. And everybody will hear him preach his celebrated sermon. The eagle stirs her nest. And then they said, at 10 o'clock, his daughter Aretha will be singing the blues. And everybody all over the city had thumbs down on Dr. C.L. Franklin. They were waiting for the crowd to come in at 8 o'clock and they packed the house out thinking that everybody would leave and the other R and B rhythm and blues crowd would come in at 10 o'clock. And when he got through preaching the eagle stirs the nest, I see him just like it was yesterday. He took his scarf, put it around his neck, put his overcoat on, and sat down. Part of the people started getting up, going out. Other crowd was coming in, and there was pure commotion and confusion. And when he sensed how confusing it was, this parent gets up and goes to the microphone and grabs it again and stands there and say, I don't know what's wrong with you all. Why you're treating me and acting like you are? I mean, Rarita is my daughter. You all think that I'm not going to sit here and listen to my daughter? If you think that's the case, what you need to do is go on 
And let whoever in come in because I am getting ready to sit down on this stage and listen to my daughter sing the blues. And then you turn around and say, Retha, come on out here, baby, and sing the blues to your daddy. And everybody in that place sat down. That's not the end of the story, though. Here's the end. The same crowd who had shouted when he preached, the eagles stand her nest. All of us shouted all over again when Aretha sang, ain't no way. Because that was his love for his daughter. And so the key to our race and where we are now, we got to have a home. We got to turn our home, turn our houses back into a home. And so as I leave you, I just want to tell you, I'm calling for pastors and preachers of the gospel across denominational lines, across racial lines, across religious lines. I'm calling upon us to lock our arms together now and we can turn black America around. You say, where shall we go and what shall we do? Right in your own neighborhoods where your church is. There are struggling single moms that don't know what to do, that needs a man in the house through mentoring programs and parenting out. We can turn black America around. And so the queen is saying to us, something must be done. Something must be done. If you would just hush and listen with me on the day, you can hear her voice saying, it's time now that my race turns its direction around and come back home to our God. As we stop here today and look at how our world is moving, civilization is torn by degradation, flirting with doom and disaster. High-mindedness runs like a mad dog and is beating in uncertain paths. Selfishness has evaporated the milk of human kindness while pain and panic are chasing each other like June bugs in the summer sun. Oh Lord, it's time now that we turn around and try to get our soul back. The queen of soul has spoken now. Time now for black America to come back home. Oh Lord, we wander far away from God, but now it's time to come home. The path of sin, too long I've wronged. Now I'm coming home. Right on King Jesus. Oh, it's a shame how wild we've allowed our children to be. Nobody can do anything with our own children. The school teacher can't handle our children. The pastor in the church can't handle our children. The police in the streets can't handle our children. Oh, it's time. Oh, shucks, I'm about to get happy here now. To turn black America around. Oh, Lord, whatever way the home goes, that's the way the world goes. Did you hear what I'm saying? As the home goes, so goes the street. As the street goes, so goes the neighborhood. As the neighborhood goes, so goes the city. 
As the city goes, so goes the state. As the state goes, so goes the nation. As a nation goes, so goes the world. Right on, King Jesus. Ah, I heard somebody saying a long time ago, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. I don't believe that, children, because it's so hard to love somebody and know that they hate you. It's hard to have love, but Aretha, the queen of soul, told us all we need to have is a little respect. Did I have a witness here? I heard her saying, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Uh, oh, a little, have a little respect. Ooh, just a little respect. Uh, Congress need to respect each other. The Democrats need to respect the Republicans. The Republicans need to respect the Democrats. The liberals need to respect the conservatives. The conservatives need to respect the liberals. The straights need to respect the gays. The gays need to respect the streets. Ah, everybody. Oh, shucks, I would have had a witness here. Ah, everybody. Ah, everybody ought to give a little respect. I'm through now, children. The queen did what she could, but it's time now for us to do what we can. I say the queen did what she could. It's time now for us to do what we can. I got one more thing to tell you. If when you give uh, the best of your service, God will, God will, God will, God will, God will. Anybody know he will? Anybody know he will? God will take care. Come on, put your hands together. The Reverend Jasper Williams.